And I would encourage you to uh, just Google Alan McNichol or get to their website and, and see his webpage on uh, the Austin Grad website because he has uploaded on his webpage all kinds of <laughs> articles he has written, especially uh, related to church matters. And I myself have benefited greatly from reading his reflections on the role of the Church of Christ in today's culture and different issues affecting uh, the Churches of Christ today. And I would encourage you to look at those articles and see the kinds of things uh, that Dr. McNichol has written. He um, has writ written some very intelligent, sophisticated reflections on who we are as God's people. And so uh, take a look at the website and you'll be blessed because you did. This morning, Dr. McNichol uh, began his thoughts on the preservation of God's endangered promises by looking at the Old Testament. This afternoon, we will move into the New Testament, so we're looking forward to hearing more uh, from Dr. McNichol, and I don't want to take up any more of his time. I'm pleased to present to you Alan McNichol. Well, I've had a delightful lunch, and uh, uh, I wish I could stay a couple more days so that I could uh, really get to know you. Uh, but uh, I've circulated around uh, to, to some extent anyway, and uh, really, uh, really excited about uh, what is going on here. I will say that I'm glad to have someone looking at stuff I've put up on my, <laughs> my web pages here. And, uh, I, I, I'm in an interesting kind of a situation there in Austin. We have at our school, which is very much a, a Church of Christ school, only Church of Christ faculty, uh, and, and, and staff working there. But we have about 50% of our students who come from all sorts of theological traditions. Uh, everything from Catholic, Orthodox, even had uh, uh, one fellow who is uh, Islam, went to study with us. He finally got a full scholarship from the Austin Presbyterian Theological Seminary, so we didn't, didn't get him. But uh, uh, we have a lot of people from uh, these churches that are uh, associated with uh, the evangelical community uh, and one of the things that I'm trying to do is convince churches of Christ that we have a special theological tradition and that what's now going on that seems to be almost the status quo in many places is that we're just another branch of the evangelical community. And uh, I would want to say, no, I think we are really a third group, really standing between uh, Catholicism and Evangelical Protestantism and that we really have a very high doctrine of the church which in some ways incorporates some ideas that come out of Catholicism uh, as well as a kind of Evangelical push uh, and direction. Uh, I, this is one fight I'm not sure I'm going to win. Uh, but I'm, I'm still waging it and uh, so any, uh, any kind of help that I might have uh, from the good folk here uh, would be appreciated. The other thing is, I talked about this at lunch, and while you know, one of the things when you're old is that you forget things, and uh, particularly for the students, I've written uh, these little books uh, that uh, we sell. Interestingly enough, I, I wrote these for people, uh, young people in the church who needed 
to be just basically informed about the faith of Churches of Christ. And uh, they haven't been as successful in the sales for these, but they've been very successful in sales for people doing prison ministry. <laughs> uh, I don't know what that indicates or what that signifies, but uh, uh, I brought these with me preparing for baptism and preparing for the Lord's Supper. And uh, I'm going to leave them here in school and anybody who wants to get a copy, they're yours. Uh, I don't want to take them back to Austin with me. Maybe this <laughs> afternoon. I want to talk uh, this afternoon in my second lecture, which will be not quite as long as the one here this morning. Uh, on the subject, the, the master story of scripture, and that's the general topic which we're dealing with today, and the topic this afternoon is the renewal of hope in the fulfillment of God's endangered promises. The renewal of hope in the fulfillment of God's endangered promises. At our last session, we left our story with the people of God somewhat in a state of demoralization. They had expected the fulfillment of the promises of God to bring a new world through the Davidic covenant and its renewal. Around the end of the exile, the prophets had raised very strong hopes that the return of the people of God to Jerusalem would constitute a new Eden, or at least a time of new beginning in keeping with the fresh start after Noah. But now centuries had passed, and this new world had not arrived is difficult to appreciate the fact we talked about this morning that God has his own time frame. It's a hard lesson to learn. I'm afraid that it's hard for us to accept today just as it was for those ancients. God's <coughs> promises sometimes seem to be unconnected with what is happening in our world today. To be truly, as we say, in danger. Jeremiah had spoken and aroused these expectations. In a passage that's very well known to us that I'll abbreviate, in Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenant which I made with the fathers, but this is the covenant which I will make. I will put my law within them, and I will write it upon their hearts and they shall be my people. Or as Ezekiel says, a new heart I will give you, and a new spirit I will put within you. Ezekiel 36, 25. But after five centuries, the people were still waiting for fulfillment. The people of God were still widely scattered. They did not have a land, and they did not have even, in the Maccabean period, a true king. Thinking about this, and uh, I think of that opening scene in Fiddler on the Roof, where the very practical Tevye watches the fiddler seemingly trying to do the impossible. 
play the fiddle on a steeply pitched roof. I think this tells it all. For how could Tevye keep his family together? How could he maintain his tradition and adjust to the rapidly changing political reality in Russia during his time? But it's not only 19th century or 18th century Russian or whatever that time was, it's our culture today. It perfectly describes the conditions in Judea and Galilee that the people of God faced in the first century of our era just as it parallels our culture. This was the world into which Jesus emerged. Changes in culture trying to hold on to the old promises. The promise of the fulfillment of God's endangered promises all of a sudden began to burst forth in the first century in God's own time. And so, of course, we come to Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus of Nazareth was convinced that a new world was dawning. In fact, he announced its revival, its arrival. He called it the kingdom. The kingdom of heaven, or sometimes as it's known in translation, the kingdom of God. He referred to the kingdom in the sense that it was the realm of God's end time salvation. The time when the ancient promises, those endangered promises we've been talking about would be fulfilled. <clears throat> Opening with some wonderful language, Matthew 4.17, Mark 1.15, this announcement comes on the heels of his baptism. It was there that the divine voice uttered the famous words, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Now this Beth Cole, this, this divine voice, is in words that tell us much. They not only echo Psalm 2.7, a reference to the restoration of the kingship of a Davidite, but Isaiah 42.1-4, God's servant, the well-pleased one, will be the vehicle of God's salvation by surviving through the travail of suffering. Now think of that, at the very announcement of his ministry, he's God's son, but he's God's son who will pass through the travail of suffering. And so these words anticipate Jesus' entire ministry as the royal servant, anchored, of course, in the scriptures, according to the scriptures. Now there's much to contemplate in these words. In effect, as the servant passages in Isaiah indicate, the divine voice at Jesus' baptism, I think this is important, is pronouncing that Jesus is renewed Israel. Think of it. Jesus is renewed Israel. In him and his ministry, Israel is being regathered. As Jesus himself says in Matthew 12, 30, He who is not with me is against me. 
and he who does not gather with me scatters. Jesus' announcement as the spokesperson of the heavenly Father, the royal Son, that the kingdom has arrived. I really want to stress this today. The kingdom has arrived was no equivocal claim. I know that we do a little jiu-jitsu and a little dance uh, and say, well, the kingdom is here, but it's not here, it's still in the future, and there's a tension between this. I don't buy that fully. Uh, there, is, there is, of course, it has not fully arrived, and we still pray that the kingdom comes. I understand that. But nevertheless, Jesus' announcement that the kingdom is here, I think, uh, is at hand. I, I understand that terminology of saying it's here. It's not equivocal. So under his auspices, the divine promises of human salvation are now in the process of fulfillment. And I've quoted Lofink a couple of times here today. He also points out that once again, these sayings are incorporated in an individual. Abraham, at first, and now after many centuries, they are concretized in another individual, Jesus, also a representative figure. Interesting point. So the new journey of fulfillment starts off with many similarities to the old. But then come some startling differences. Immediately after the baptism, the Gospels, especially Matthew, gives us a set of parallels with the early wilderness experiences of Israel. Isn't that interesting? That we again go over that same territory. Israel was in the wilderness for 40 years. Jesus for 40 days. Israel was hungry and tempted in the wilderness. So was Jesus. To satisfy their hunger, Israel was given food, for, uh, uh, food by divine provision. Jesus stayed alive by the word of God. But then the parallels begin to diverge. Israel rebelled in the wilderness. But according to the narrative, Jesus was faithful. The wilderness generation failed to enter the land. But Jesus' venture into the wilderness ended in a return to aspects of Eden. If you read carefully the accounts in Matthew and Mark, angels ministered to him. And as promised by Isaiah, he lives peaceably with the wild beasts. God's new world has begun. Moving out of the wilderness, he immediately begins the call of the twelve, the new Israel. And returning to Galilee, in the new land, through the call for participation in his new family, I believe he fulfills the land promise. He does this by showing that the bountiful benefits of life equivalent to the promised blessings of the land will take place in the realm of his new family. In this process, Israel is being recreated before their eyes. Now, 
This is the offer that shook the foundations of the isolated villages of Galilee in Jesus' day. This was revolutionary. At last, someone was plausibly saying that the centuries-old endangered promises were being fulfilled. Those with uncontrollable compulsions, we talked about that a little at lunch today, biblically speaking, and you have analogs today, the demon-possessed, were freed. The sick were healed before their very eyes. Evil is on the retreat. In the ministry of Jesus, God's sovereignty was becoming dominant. No wonder the crowds flocked from everywhere to witness what was taking place. You know, I've been over there, uh, and walked around Galilee a lot, and people just didn't come out of those villages by the thousands, simply because uh, they didn't have anything else to do. Something, given the centuries past and the hopes that were set forth, is happening. The time is here. It is being fulfilled. Now, one of the great mistakes I think we have made is to say that Jesus' announcement of the kingdom was totally spiritual. <coughs> now, it's fighting words to some, but uh, I understand why we're doing this in some sense. On a base level, we do not want to entangle the church and the politics of the day perish the thought that we may do anything to lose our cherished tax exemption. <laughs> N.T. Wright tells the story of being in Chile during one of their times of political upheaval. <clears throat> and a prominent ecclesiastical dignitary was speaking there. And as they were coming out of the assembly, a group of soldiers, nervously massaging their automatic rifles, greeted them. Did he say anything political? The soldiers continued to massage their rifles. Then they said, he can speak about the spiritual, but we are in charge of the political. And I think we've got to get it through our heads that this difference between spiritual and political is our distinction. That in Jesus' day, the world was being changed. And of course it had political ramifications. I remember uh, some years ago, back now in 1984, uh, it was at Passover time and I, I, I gathered with some people and we, uh, we got on a couple of buses that went up into the Palestinian territories uh, to see a Samaritan Passover service. And as we're coming back that night, people were throwing stones at us. Uh, but earlier, uh, there were about 600 people gathered on Mount Geras in there. And there were the soldiers sitting on all the little houses up there with their automatic rifles. They knew 
that any time a crowd gathered, there may be some kind of ramifications. And so we should remember that the crowds in their thousands did not just come out for esoteric things. They were looking for real change. And what Jesus' ministry portended was a full-scale shake-up for the people of Israel. The promises that we were reading about this morning were to be fulfilled. As Isaiah promised, it would shake the created order itself in the first century. There is there's no absolute separation between the spiritual and the political. And the leaders of Israel, even the Romans, knew that. But, and I think this is a word for us today as a church, if we take seriously the way of the kingdom. Because I believe the kingdom is still here. But this was just the problem. Was Israel going to seize the moment? Would it really believe, despite all the things that Jesus was doing before their eyes, could they believe that it really now was here? Apparently, in Jesus' case, it did not believe. That was a problem. As the ministry of Jesus progressed, it became more and more <coughs> apparent that his neighbors in Galilee and down in Judea began to have reservations about Jesus' message. And I've thought a lot about this. I have students who say, well, if he did all these things that the gospel say, surely they would believe. Raising Jairus' daughter from the dead. But I think the failure of the nerve comes in their, in their thinking about who Jesus was. How could someone from such a significant, uh, an insignificant place as Nazareth be the agent of such a definitive word from God? And you who go out and preach on Sunday and open the word of God uh, before the faithful and others, Sometimes we forget just what a revolutionary thing that really is. And for someone who came from this little two-bit town of Nazareth, could he be the agent that God has used to bring the fulfillment of the promises? Could you be his agent in the town in which you preach? He is claiming that we stand at the brink of the precipice of judgment. But look around. Things appear a little different than what they've always been. Let us wait. Let us reserve our opinions and see what happens. And so Jesus could certainly see that his word by and large was not heeded. Israel, as constituted at that time, had set itself on another course. One that was leading to revolution against Rome and to its destruction. And so he began to have this streak that comes into his mission. 
where uh, he begins to see that this other element of the suffering service uh, will uh, begin to come. And so he tells many parables on this theme. I think one is particularly germane that I've loved over the years as recorded in Luke 13, 6 through 9. I'll abbreviate it, but it basically says this. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. Think of the ministry of Jesus. He came seeking fruit on it and found none. And he said to the keeper, Lo, these three years I have come seeing fruit on this fig tree, and I find none. Cut it down. Israel stands also at the precipice of judgment if it will not accept his word. Cut it down. Why should it use up the ground? The keeper responded, let it alone for one year till I dig about it and put on manure. If it bears fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. The words of Jesus. The time was short. Jesus knew that he had no alternative but to confront the power structures of his people. Would they hear what he had to say? So he journeyed to Jerusalem. We all know what happened after he arrived in Jerusalem. There's plenty of evidence that Jesus envisioned there a negative response to the invitation to repent and to accept his word that a new world was dawning upon them. The best known words, of course, are the passion predictions. Probably uh, in their mark and form, Mark 8, 31, 9, 31, 10, 33 through 34. And most critical scholars argue that these sayings have undergone some editorial changes in the process of transmission. But even if this is the case, it is clear that Jesus was very much aware that when he reached the holy city, he knew he would receive a negative reception. And so we read in Luke 13, 33 through 35, Nevertheless, I must go on my way today and tomorrow and the day following. For it cannot be that a prophet should perish away from Jerusalem. O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, killing the prophets and stoning those who are sent to you, how often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wing? <coughs> and you would not. Behold, your house is forsaken. So I believe Jesus unfolds a clear prophetic stance to what he saw was about to unfold. As God's servant of Isaiah 40 through 55, he would become the representative of Israel and in his ordeal take upon himself the punishment for their sin. Then, after a short ordeal shared by his flock or new family that he has pulled together, the benefits of his work as the servant of Isaiah's prophecy by means of his expiratory death would be made available for his people. Steeled by these connections, Jesus set his face toward Jerusalem and confronted his belligerent detractors. Well, we know, of course, what happened. 
Jesus was arrested and despite many prayers the core of Jesus's little flock ran away who would carry on the word and message about the kingdom and the value of the expiatory death of Jesus. Who would say that there was one who had suffered vicariously on their behalf the punishment for Israel's sin? Now, of course, the infamy of the acts of abandonment by the disciples is, of course, well known. And yet, in light of what I've been talking about today, I wonder whether we have contemplated as much as we should the massive disorder of it all. I think of John 21, 3, where the disciples are back again in their old haunts by the Sea of Galilee, or as John calls it, Tiberias. Peter rather casually says, <coughs> after it's all over, I'm going fishing. Saw so some wonderful fishing places coming over here. Uh, yesterday from Huntsville. I'm going fishing. As if there's nothing much else to do. And then others who are with him say, we will go with you. Nothing else to do, so they set off to find a boat. Can you imagine people who are more demoralized after all that we have talked about today, the very ones that Jesus had chosen to be the key instruments to proclaim the word about the kingdom are now in a state of massive <coughs> disorder. The fulfillment of the promises seem to be spinning into a spiral of chaos. Was there ever a time when God's promises seemed more endangered. But as we all know, that was not the end of the story, was it? Jesus of Nazareth appeared to this demoralized group and in a series of authoritative appearances from Peter to Paul, mentioned in 1 Corinthians 15, the core of a little flock gathered by Jesus came back together. A new chapter in the story began to unfold. He was raised according to the scriptures. The promise lives on. As with all the other chapters, however, there were surprises. Do you remember at the beginning of these lectures we talked about the fact that God has chosen a special people? But they are elect or set aside for the single purpose of bringing the word of salvation to all human kind. At the end of Romans 3, Paul states that God is not the God of the Jews only. Himself, of course, uh, ethnically Jewish. He's not the God of the Jews only. That is the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel by lineage. Our God is a universal God. And to show that universality, he must also come to be the God of all other peoples. 
This includes, of course, the Gentiles. Only then will the kingdom be all in all. And yet a funny thing happened in the immediate days after the resurrection of Jesus. I mean, funny in the sense that it was not hilarious, but in the sense that it was not. You see, the little flock or community that Jesus had gathered together, soon takes on the name church, began to grow and spread. But as the decades began to pass, it was becoming more and more obvious that the physical descendants of Abraham, those for Jesus, offered <coughs> his expiatory sacrifice uh, initially, and of course the many for the Gentiles as well, were rejecting the word that Jesus was their hope for salvation. While at the same time the Gentiles were open and receptive to the message. To even such a protagonist of the Gentile mission as Paul, this is baffling. In a, a often overlooked passage, I referred to it at the luncheon uh, session today, in Romans 9, 1 through 6, Paul is in a state of pathos over the situation of his fellow Jews did not understand what Jesus had done. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ, according to Paul, for the sake of my brethren, my kinsmen by race. They are Israelites, and listen to this, and to them belong the sonship, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship of and the promises. And then he goes on in 9, 1 through 6, actually 9 through 11 as you recall, to wonder out aloud, has it all failed? And Paul, who claims the tradition that Christ is raised according to the scriptures in is the fulfillment of the promises. Has it all failed? As you well know, the later chapters of Romans are full of response to this issue. And Paul, a devout believer, cannot accept the notion that the very vehicles to whom God entrusted the promises for centuries have been cast aside. In Romans 11, he sets forth the proposition. Again in God's own time, Israel will accept its Messiah. We, the people of God of the last days, I think, accept this proposition. We're biblical. But see, once again we're in the world of an endangered promise. Now, I have to be honest with you this afternoon. I've often prayed and wondered about how this promise too will be resolved. It's a major, major issue if we want to be New Testament Christians. And it was not only Paul who worried about this point. I know that many of you have probably wondered about the ending of the book of Acts. I had a lady come to me the other day and ask me about this. I said, you don't need to be so much worried about what happened to Paul. Although that's an in a question I don't know whether I have an exact answer for either. But there's another one lurking there that's equally important. All along in Luke Acts, Jesus has been pictured as the one who has come to fulfill the promises and save Israel. 
we'll soon be coming up on the Christmas season and we'll hear Luke 1 and 2 over and over again. But just as we have been waiting for the fulfillment of that promise and talking about it today, think of the age Simeon in Luke 2. He takes the babe Jesus in his arms and states, Lord, now let your servant depart in peace according to your word, for mine eyes have seen your salvation, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and glory for your people Israel. And here he is, cradling the little babe Jesus in his arms. And right throughout Luke Acts, there is this anticipation that Jesus will somehow be the vehicle to bring this salvation, but it keeps being postponed. And then we come right to the very end of Acts, Acts chapter 28, 17 through 31. Paul is still speaking to the Jews. They're divided about him. Some were convinced, Acts 28, 24. Others are not. And Acts ends with this. The door is still open. The door is still open. We're still expecting, as Paul himself in the letters, also in Luke Acts, we're still expecting Israel to hear. That mission is not closed. And so to those of us who live within the orbit of biblical faith, someday we believe God will fulfill these promises. And so I come to my final heading for these two lectures today, which you've kindly uh, been listening to. I've called it Waiting for the Final Resolution. Already in the first century, where there were those who wondered about the word that the ordeal before the day of resurrection that Jesus talked about would be short. It seemed to be going on for quite a while before that final promise of redemption and God's new world comes. And so they began to doubt. Second Peter 3 3 through 4 tells us about them. First of all, you must understand this, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own passions and saying, where is the promise of his coming? <coughs> For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things have continued as they were from the beginning of creation. Will it ever change? Will the promises of God be fulfilled ultimately? This is a message for us today. We're aware that demoralization is rampant in many places in the church. Year by year, the little flock that Jesus started, that was so excited with the news that the kingdom has come, seems to diminish, both in numbers and in effectiveness. The promises of God's kingdom being all in all seem once again to be in danger. Yet surely 
this is not the complete picture of reality. We have gone over several millennia today. We have not come so far to lose it at the very end. And if we've learned anything from these lectures, it is that God intervenes in his own time. As Second Peter goes on to say in 3.8, But do not ignore this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The parousia of our Lord and resurrection and renovation day is coming. Just as the promises were fulfilled earlier, it will be sudden and unexpected, like the coming of a thief in the night. In the last several years, I've been doing a lot of work on the book of Revelation. What has struck me about this book is the level of assurance it has that the promises given to the people of Judah centuries before Christ will finally be brought to completion in a new creation. No literal temple or sanctuary will be needed the people of Zion will acknowledge the Lordship of Jesus and the nations will submit to his way as the apocalypse states by its light that is God's presence among us will the nations walk and to it the kings of the earth will bring their splendor dare we give up on these promises in which the core message of Scripture consists. As Paul says, for all the promises of God has their yes in Him. That is why when we give glory to Him, I'm quoting Paul, it is through Christ Jesus that we say, Amen. 2 Corinthians 1. 20. God works in his own time. A day is coming when he will bring the final redemption and renovation. The master story of scripture then will be brought to completion. In the meanwhile, we live in faith <coughs> and trust that since God has fulfilled so many of his scriptures, above all, in fulfilling the promises of the resurrection of Jesus, that he will fulfill those last ones and that we too, his faithful, will share in the resurrection of the dead. That is the word of hope I leave to you today and thank you again for the time that I have been with you and honored uh, more so than you really know uh, to give these series of lectures in the name of uh, of the Jackie Lewis. I uh, knew him uh, through going to many meetings of the Society of Biblical Literature, but in keeping with the word uh, that I've been bringing today, uh, one time I was in Jerusalem and uh, I was there on the Lord's Day. And I 
went to the little Arab church at that time, which was near the walls of the old city. And I met Jack and our mate. Uh, 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 they were there. Uh, he was there on uh, an Albright Fellowship. And uh, they invited me home uh, to, uh, to the Albright Center. I spent a delightful afternoon with them. And uh, they were just wonderful. And uh, we walked around the old city and looked at many of the old tombs and uh, just shared many of the archaeological sites. So he's uh, a man of faith and a man of trust and above all, a wonderful church. In him rests God's promises, and it is to him then I dedicate these lectures. Now I'm going to have to be running off here to um, catch a plane here in, in a few minutes, but let me say uh, I've enjoyed very much our time together. And I think uh, what we'll do is just have final conclusions, and then uh, I'll, I'll just remain behind here for a few minutes if you have any informal questions. Uh, let's go ahead with those. In the meanwhile, uh, particularly students, you can go and pick up these books. Thanks.